Hello and welcome to this webinar on PPL delivered by the ISM Trust. And my name is Ben Hogwood. I'm the Classical Repertoire Manager at PPL, where I've worked for 16 years. I'm a part-time cellist, uh, with emphasis on the part-time, um, but I am a performer member of PPL myself, so I'm familiar with the way we work both from the outside and the inside. Uh, part of my job is to regularly visit orchestras and performers around the UK and to work with individual performers across all genres, not just classical, um, to ensure that they are getting the most they can from PPL. Before we begin the, web the webinar, I wanted to make just a couple of technical points. Uh, you can't see me, but you should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation. And you should also be able to hear me, but I can't hear you. So if you have any questions, please type them into the questions box and I'll answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation or during if it's appropriate. And to add that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at ism.org forward slash webinars. So over the next hour, um, I hope to take you through the PPL story briefly, the difference between us and PRS for Music, who we license around the UK and the world, the revenue we collected in 2016 and how that split when we pay it out, how you as a performer can register and how you can use my PPL, our online service. And then I wanted to talk about the international collection service that we do, some US tax benefits that we have and some important dates in the calendar for the next year. Because hopefully, if you're on this webinar, you're um, a partaker in recorded music, you've recorded some music, you'd either like to register or you are a member of PPL already. I hope to be able to help you, whichever it is. So about PPL, um, I'm going to take you all the way back to 1934 for this. Um, the three composers on the screen, you may recognise them, especially if you're classically orientated. From left to right, we've got Sir Edward Elgar, Gustav Holst and Frederick Delius, three great composers who all sadly died in 1934. But in that year, PPL was formed, Phonographic Performance Licensing. And we were formed as a result of court action taken by EMI and Decker against the cafe in Bristol who were playing music. The judge ruled in favour of the record companies and PPL was formed. Since then, we've become much, as much about performers as rights holders, especially since 1996, when performers gained the equitable right to remuneration on sound recordings from the EU. At PPL, our whole aim, especially in member services, obviously, is to serve the members. So we exist to ensure that those who invest their time, talent and money to make recorded music are fairly paid for their work. We license this recorded music that's played in public or broadcast in the UK. And then we distribute the fees that we collect to our performer and recording rights holder members. We collect money for public and performance, public performance and broadcasting and additional rights such as private copy income in many territories around the world. And we manage those rights that our members give to us so that we can maximise the earnings from broadcast and public performance and distribute them as quickly and efficiently as possible. So to bring this to life a little, I'm going to play you a short video about how recorded music is used and where we collect. Uh, it's about a minute and a half long and it's voiced by Six Music's Lauren Laverne who is herself a member from PPL days as Kanicki. Recorded music is played in many different businesses and organisations across the country, from offices to shops. This makes them nicer places to work and gives staff and customers a better experience. At PPL, we make sure that the people who invest their time, talent and money to make the music everyone enjoys are fairly paid. 
Because the law allows record companies and performers the right to be paid when their recorded music is used, PPL exists to make sure this money reaches them. Without us, businesses and organizations would need to seek permission from every single individual performer or record company to play their music. We make it easy. We issue licenses to businesses that play recorded music and in return, collect a fee, which we then distribute as payments to our members. So, if you use recorded music in your business, you may need to purchase a license from PPL. If you're a performer or record company and your music is broadcast on the radio, TV or played in public, join PPL today. So hopefully that made things a little clearer to you. And moving on from that, I'm going to talk about the slight and subtle differences that we have between PPL and PRS for music. PPL look after the master rights to a sound recording. PRS for music look after the composition. So that is the music, the arrangements, lyrics and libretto. And PPL and PRS are in fact forming a joint venture which will start next year to ensure that we are collecting the public performance licensing money together. So who do we license at PPL? We license upwards of 380,000 UK businesses and organisations. So as you saw in the video, that varies from very small premises such as hairdressers to large nightclubs and bars. We also license more than 400 TV broadcast channels. So that's all the ones that you'll be familiar with, such as the BBC channels, Sky, ITV, Channel 4 and 5. Upwards of 330 commercial radio stations are licensed by us. So that's Classic FM, for instance, Capital, the Heart FM group, uh, KISS, all the ones that you hear regularly. And all of these broadcasters are required as part of their agreements to tell us everything that they play. In addition, we license upwards of 1,500 online radio services, as well as community radio and student radio. Some more figures for you. Now, this is more about the contents of our repertoire database, where we actually have now more than 11 million sound recordings, even more than it says there. We have 90,000 members in total. These are performers and rights holders. In a typical airplay year, we collect 407 billion seconds of airplay, which uh, is beyond my imagination, certainly. And 83 international agreements when this presentation was done, although happily I can say that's gone up to 84. Um, as I'll show you a bit later on. So putting that into a chart, um, which makes, makes it easier to track how we work, hopefully. Along the top, we've got the revenue that we get from our licensees, the airplay data that they give to us, and the audience data too, which is very important when we are deciding with our distribution committee how the payments should be made. Then across the bottom, we have the repertoire data that we take from our rights holders, which is typically the record labels, but could also be self-releasing artists. So if you're one of those, then this certainly applies to you. You would supply that to us. The rights holders give us their rights data for different territories around the world, not just the UK. And we also have the member data, which is crucial, such as bank details. If you're known by any other names as a performer, um, it's important that you give all that to us, but I'll take you through that a bit later on. So sharing with you our 2016 results, you can see that in total we collected just above £212 million for 2016, an 8% growth on 2015. Now public performance collections exceeded that collected from broadcast and that happened in the 2015 for the first time and continued in 2016. 
But as you'll see next to that, international is a big growth area, up 32%. And that's due to new deals and collective management organisations, or as we might call them CMOs, paying out backdated revenues to us. So we have all this money that has come in, and of course it is PPL's absolute duty to pay as much of it out as we possibly can. So for a typical broadcast, half the money will go to the rights holder, and then the performer share, which you can see on the left-hand side here, 65% goes to featured performers, or upwards of 65%. Non-featured performers are allocated 10 to 35%. There are some subtle variations to this within classical reptile, which I'll talk to you about a bit later on. And if you need a um, definition of what a featured and non-featured performer is, I would um, recommend you visit the PPL website for detailed legal definitions of those. So moving on to a more specifically classical example, I've chosen the recent recording that the Philharmonia made of um, some Nielsen works. I'm going to take the flute concerto there on the left hand side as an example. So we would call the featured performers on that recording Samuel Coles, the flautist, and Pavel Yervi, the conductor. So between them, they would receive 65% of any broadcast monies that we collect for that recording. Then on the right hand side, we have the Philharmonia. They receive 35%. And if you expand that, if there was a choir in this recording, they would also be part of that 35%. It's important to note, though, that this rule changes when we have just one featured performer and more than 40 musicians or singers because our performer board felt that that was um, becoming an imbalance if the conductor would still get 65%. So in instances like this, um, where I've taken the Tchaikovsky symphonies as an example, we would halve the featured chair and give the conductor 32.5% and the remainder would go to the many who are the orchestra or the choir and it would be equally split between all of those members. If one of the orchestra was perhaps playing a more featured role and the artwork reflected this, um, using a classical example you could say the violinist in Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov, then they might qualify for a featured chair but we would very much deal with that on a case by case basis in our performer claims process, which again, I'll talk you through a bit later on. So that's details on how we collect the money and a high level overview of how we pay it out. Now, hopefully some of you watching this webinar have not yet joined PPL and are curious to do so. Hopefully you've made some recordings or you are about to. In this case, this next few slides will be of great interest to you because it will show you how to register with PPL, which I'm pleased to say is a stress-free process. And very importantly, it is completely free. So we will not charge for registration. So working from the left-hand side, the first thing to do for you to register as a PPL member is to visit our website, pplukcom now, on that website, you will see a section called I Make Music, where you can learn a bit more about the benefits of joining and the work that PPL does. Then you would click on the blue box, Become a Member. In the middle section, you would say to us how you would like to register. So I'm guessing that the top option would be the most commonly used, that you would want to register as a performer member. If, however, you are what we call a self-releasing performer, so you own the rights to your recordings as well, then do bear in mind the third in the list where you can register as both at the same time, just to smooth the process over. Also important to know the bottom option. Um, I'm a beneficiary of a deceased performer because PPL do still pay 
um, the estates of performers who are deceased when their recordings are played on the radio or broadcast in any other way. So then assuming that we do take the top option and we want to register as a performer, the right hand screen will show you what needs to be done. So you complete the performer registration form. Within that, you would give us an idea of the repertoire that you perform on and you'd give us your personal details, your contact details, bank details, and then you would provide us with proof of signature, date of birth and address. Driving license is always the best thing to use for that because that should have all of those things on there. Or you can use a combination of passport and utility bill. Then when you've completed the form, you print and sign and you send it to us either in a scan form or by the post. And we process it for you and let you know if we have any queries about your registration. If not, you are fully registered as a PPR member. So I hope that's clear on registration. Feel free to ask any questions about registration if you have any. So moving on, I'm going to explain to you how you can then use a bespoke service for PPR members to keep your account up to date once you've registered. So if you're a performer member, then you can make claims on your repertoire, which uses our PPR repertoire database to find the recordings that you're on, and you can make a claim on those recordings if you're not listed on them already. If you're a rights holder, in addition to a performer member, you have the chance to register your repertoire and once registered, you can amend those recordings as well. And for performers and rights holders, my PPL enables you to update your contact and payment details, especially if you get married or move house, it's very important to keep those things up to date. You can raise queries with our member services team through our portal. You can view detailed statements of your payments, whether in the UK or worldwide. And you can ensure that your US tax form is up to date. So here's the My PPL homepage. And that shows you how you can do those things. So on the left hand side, you've got Manage Music. So you can search our database for all the repertoire that we have, those 11 million recordings. You can make a new claim. And I can show you that within those 11 million recordings, we can narrow it down to the, the ones that you need to find particularly. As I said, you can register a recording. You can fix invalid recordings. That's not so much to worry about if you're uh, not a rights holder. Then in the middle, as we said, we can manage your account. You can contact us and you can view your registrations. And then on the timeline, we've got some important dates for the diary. So you can see there sessions that we offer to PPR members, such as uh, the middle one on the 4th of October. Um, we can offer you tips on how to boost your income. We can help you with registering your repertoire. And the one that's just gone is the international payment that we made out on uh, Friday, the 29th of September. You'll also see MTV distribution payment there. That's for rights holders only and more specifically video rights holders only. And a helpful addition across the top is that you can see whether you have any open claims to PPL or queries. You can see the international coverage. So that's all the um, territories that we will be uh, claiming on your behalf, because when you register, you sign an international mandate. And that gives us the permission to go around the world and share details of your uh, membership of PPL and your airplay with all the other societies that we have dealings with. So I'm going to take you on through uh, searching for repertoire on our repertoire database, because probably the first thing you do after you've registered you will want to find your recordings and make sure that you're listed on them. 
So to do this, you use our repertoire database, which has recently uh, had a refresh in consultancy with our membership and is hopefully uh, quite a lot easier to use than it was previously. So as you can see, you can search by recordings or products. You can look at your repertoire only, which is helpful once you've made claims. We always recommend, especially with classical repertoire, that the search terms are relatively loose. So by that, mean, by that I mean for band artist name, rather than saying is, we say includes certain words. And the same with recording title. So in this instance, um, a sort of a case, really, you could say that uh, as I'm a part time cellist, I'm going to assume for the purposes of this webinar that I have performed on Ravel's Piano Concerto with Stephen Osborne as the soloist. So to find Ravel's Piano Concerto, as you can imagine, there's quite a few recordings of that work, so it's going to have to be narrowed down a bit. So as the band artist's name, we can expect Stephen Osborne to be included in that. So we put that first. And then as part of the recording title, we're going to include the word concerto. Again, important to use the includes facility on that search term. So using that term brings the results that you will see in front of you there. Now, if you look down the left hand side at the title and artist, you might notice that none of those appear to have anything to do with the Ravel Piano Concerto. And this is a way of showing just how far the PPL database can go and how we, we might need to narrow this search down a bit. So it has actually brought back an earlier recording by Stephen Osborne for the BBC of Mozart. It's brought back each movement of his recording of the Stravinsky made earlier with the BBC Scottish, but as yet, we're not having any joy finding the Ravel. So you might decide that we need to try something a little bit more exact to find the Ravel. Now, what record companies tend to do when they're submitting to BPL is include quite full details of each of the classical movements. We've encouraged them to do this to make it easier for performers to find their repertoire, especially classical performers. But of course, it, it carries on for pop that we want some very searchable terms in the title and artist, mm -hmm. ones that performers will understand. So we're going to try again, including Osborne as the band artist name. But this time we're going to use a quite fancy term that Ravel uses in the first movement of his piano concerto, Allegramente. Searching with that, even then we still have two results. So we have one of the Beethoven Bagatelles that he recorded back in 2012, but we do now have what looks like the Ravel first movement displayed as it's been sent into us by Hyperion with Stephen Osborne, BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, Ludovic Morlo. So they can all be used as search terms in the artist, band artist name, then the recording title, it's nice and full. We've got piano concerto in, B, in G major, and then in brackets, details about the uh, movement. You'll notice we don't have the composer there. We do ask record companies to include that where possible, and we are still working with them just to make sure that we can have that facility available to them. There's another more exact way of finding all the recordings on this Ravel disc in one go. So you may have noticed that you can also search by product on the repertoire database. So you simply select product in the dark blue there. And if you know the catalog number of the release that you're looking for, which is usually quite easily found on the record company website, you can put it in here. Now searching by that and moving from the product detail to the track listing, you can see we've got a full list there of the whole release as released by Hyperion. So tracks one to three 
of the Ravel Piano Concerto. Tracks four to six are the fire, Nights in the Gardens of Spain, or the Spanish equivalent as it has there. We can store alternative title as well, so that's a good option for rights holders. It means that we can hopefully find things both by the language in which they were written and the English alternative. Then at the bottom, we've got the Ravel left hand piano concerto. You'll notice that's all in one movement and it's 18 minutes 13. So we would only need to, to look at that once to make a performer claim. So speaking of making performer claims, we're going to assume, as I said, that I played on this Ravel recording um, and that I want to make sure that my name as a PPL performer is listed on each of the recordings on this disc, but we're going to specifically focus on the Ravel first movement. So to make a claim as a performer, you search for the recordings that you've contributed to. You identify those that you are not linked to, and then you move your recordings to the claims basket. So you can simply do that by ticking on the left hand side there next to the PPL recording ID. That will then give you the option to move. If you click the claim, uh, the slightly grayed out button on the right hand side, click the claim button. And it will move it to your claims basket. So when you bring up the claims basket, you can deal with all your claims at once. So you can find all your repertoire to start with, move it all over to the claims basket. This is especially useful if your performer role, as we would call it, is a one-off, as in me just being a cellist and not doing anything else, not playing percussion or, or singing or anything. So when you're ready to consider submitting your recordings to PPL, you would declare the contribution category that you are. So as an orchestral performer in this instance, I would be a non-featured artist. You search for the role that you've performed, which in this case is cello. And you give us the country of performance, which is United Kingdom. Now, all these three are fields that PPL require to be able to distribute accurately. So having selected those, as I did the other day, you can see that I've created this claim on the 13th of November. You can see my full name as a performer. You would be able to see your PPL ID where the uh, orange ellipse is. See your contribution category as a non-featured artist. And you can vary between them if, you, uh, if you're a performer who has several different roles and sort of functions on your recordings. We've got the role of cello, country performance, United Kingdom, and status, which has now changed to complete because I've given uh, PPL all the information that we need. So then when you're ready to submit this claim to PPL, you tick the box, the confirmation box, and submit your completed claims. You may be asked to supply evidence uh, for PPL to support your claim. We do this to ensure um, for auditing, auditing purposes that the claims we are getting from performers are wholly genuine, which obviously in the vast majority of cases they are. But if people make multiple claims at once, um, we always ask for covering evidence, um, which can be easily found, such as information on a CD inlay, um, track specific information on Discogs or another similar site or confirmation from someone else who was in the studio at the time, a featured performer, all these things you'll be able to find as evidence criteria and you can find those on the PPL website. We also do ask for evidence at certain, for tracks of a certain value. So if a track has reached a particular value in our distribution, we would ask for evidence again for auditing purposes. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about improvements in performer data. Now this is something that PPL have been driving for the last few years in particular. 
because we recognise the importance that when the rights holder, in this case Hyperion, submit details of their recordings to us, we have the opportunity to get the performer lineups from them immediately. And if we can do that, that obviously eases the burden on yourselves to keep track of all the things that you've performed on. It means that we get the data up front, often before airplay even happens, because a lot of record companies are, are very efficient at sending us their pre-release data. So we're using a couple of examples here, which is the Ravel example that I talked about me potentially being a cellist on. And then on the right hand side, we've got a Stanford choral disc with the choir of Trinity College and Stephen Layton. So these lineups are taken from the Hyperion website and it shows the detail that rights holders are now going into where they give us all of these names regarding the tracks that they've played for. So on the left hand side, you'll see the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra. That's a full lineup for that disc of Ravel and Fire, but it's also track specific. So as you can see, a lot of the stream players, they've specified not tracks one to three. And that's reflected in the data that they send to us. So Hyperion and other classical rights holders that are very good at, at sending us orchestral data and all rights holders, they will give us performer names on the left hand side. Again, looking at that. PPL then take those names and match them to the individual accounts as we hold them. Now, once that match is made by PPL, we can then be sure that when that data comes in again from the same rights holder, we do not then have to look at it. It's automatically matched, goes through onto our repertoire database, and you as members, as PPL members, would be able to see that information. Then on the right hand side, for instance, we've got the members of Trinity College Choir Cambridge. And we've got specific names for the brass as well as used in the Stanford. So as of January the 1st, 2016, PPL made it mandatory for rights holders to tell us who is on a recording. If it's a new recording with a P date of 2016 or later, and it's made in the UK, then a rights holder has an obligation to tell us who is on a recording. If they don't have full details of the ensemble, which sometimes is the case that rights holders do not always have exact information, we still ask for a firm indication of the ensemble that's on the recording. Or if, for instance, the track is a, a solo piano recital, we would just ask for confirmation that there is only one featured performer on that and nobody else that we need to take account of. And PPL have links with orchestras. We have very strong links with the orchestras who are extremely good at giving us data that we ask for and which we can then import into our system if required. So I hope that's clear on how to make a claim for PPL. Don't worry if it's kind of seems quite a difficult thing to do at the moment. The best thing to do once you're registered with PPL is to have a look at the system and get used to how it works and how you can find the data. And if you get into any problems with making claims, you can, of course, get in touch with our member services team who are very experienced in the use of this system. And um, I'll be putting contact details at the end of this webinar so that you can call in because that's your privilege as a, a PPL member. So let's assume that you've made your claims, you've got your list of repertoire, you're fully registered with PPL. Um, PPL have now made a payment to you. You've been a PPL member for a little while and we've made payments to you for UK and international royalties. Now this page will show you the sort of level of information that you can get down to from PPL so that you can find out where those payments have come from, um, whether they're broadcast or public performance. So for the uh, inventively named Joe Blogs, we've got his 
most recent payment there at the top level of the, uh, the itemized invoice. So you can see that that was made on the 29th of September as um, that would have been an international payment. When you drill into that payment, as you can see on the payment below, you get more exact information on how that payment has come about. So you can download a tax statement for your records. You have a recording allocation, which is fully available for UK broadcast, especially where if any of your recordings were played, for instance, on BBC Radio 3, you would have information on the recordings that have earned the money and where that money has come from. You get a revenue analysis that you can download. We'll have a look at that in a minute. But it's important to note that for some international payments, um, because of the nature of the data we're getting, it varies a lot worldwide. So we don't always have track level information available, but we provide you, the performers, with as much information as we can. So the revenue analysis section goes into a lot more detail and we find that performers who have been using this is a very useful guide to where they can almost maximize their promotion. Because if you look at the distri distribution summary at the top, you'll see that for our fictional performer, Henry Mann, the bulk of his earnings are coming from commercial radio and from public performance. So from that, he might think, Henry might think that his music is doing particularly well on commercial radio and he might target it more in that direction. But we have found that um, performers and performers representatives, because you can have a representative look at your account if you uh, give them the appropriate permission. We find that they, they get a lot out of this uh, particular page. And if you look at the top broadcast revenue sources, you'll see that breaks down from commercial radio. You can actually see the radio stations that are making up that payment. And you also see, you get an idea of how much a play on, on each of those might be worth. It's worth mentioning that it's always difficult for us to, to tell you how much a play on, for instance, Radio 2 is worth, because it always varies from year to year, depending on the data we get from, from the broadcaster. So I hope that's good so far. Again, feel free to ask any questions if you have them. I'm going to move on now to talk about PPL's International Collection Service. So here you get an idea of the territories that PPL covers with our international agreements. And you can see across the world that um, Europe is very well covered, USA, Canada. We're beginning to make inroads into South America. And with each of these territories, we're dealing with a separate collection organization known as a CMO. That's a collection management organization that I mentioned earlier. But just to give an example, um, using another classical example, for instance, Jonas Kaufmann is a member of GVL in Germany. Um, and if his music is played on the radio in the UK, what we would do is forward that money to GVL in Germany and they would pay it on to him. But it works the other way around as well. So if Sir Simon Rattle is played in Germany, which is extremely likely given his Berlin Philharmonic career, the revenue for that airplay is sent to PPL and we would give that to Simon Rattle. So just a reminder that this presentation will be available so you can have a, a good look at this diagram in particular and you can see the extent of the PPL coverage. We've got 83 international agreements, although happily that's gone up one more. We've got another string to our bow in the uh, shape of Slovakia. Um, and you can see on the right hand side that all these countries that we have agreements with or a selection of them are listed there for you. 
Now, for international collections, PPL's cost is particularly low. PPL's cost of revenue um, for general collections is 14.8%. Uh, but for international collections, because the, uh, the process is more streamlined and uh, works quicker, it can go as low as 7%. And this is lower than most neighbouring rights agencies uh, may charge. What we also do is business services, where PPL help other territories with a lot of their back-end data and payment processes. And that began in 2014 with Latvia. So if you remember, I presented the results that we had for 2016, and we have a total of 48.3 million pounds for international that we collected in that time. A 32% growth on 2015, but important to note that currency has played a, a part in this with the value of the pound. So on a currency neutral basis, our increase though is still 16%. And at this point, it's relevant to say, particularly that Brexit, we do not envisage it greatly affecting our international collections because we have international agreements with each CMO from each country or territory, rather. They're all individual agreements and they're independent of the, the Brexit decision. So if you look at the breakdown there, you'll see that the biggest territory is the US, even though the US still regrettably do not pay out for radio broadcast, we still collect digital revenue from them. Now others obviously is a, a large group of companies, but just below that is France, and then Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, European countries, but we are making greater headway in other territories such as Japan, Korea, further flung territories and Brazil. So if I show you a sort of graph of our international revenue over the last five years, <clears throat> excuse me, we began with a very small international team about 10 years ago. We now have a, a firmly dedicated international team bringing the money in from around the world, as I said, and you can see there how much that has grown. But you can also see how it does fluctuate. And this is because each society in the territory, they're all at different stages in the, the payments that they're making. So we are sometimes getting bigger back payments um, for specific countries. So I mentioned that um, US tax is a thing that we can focus on. PPL have been able to gain what we call qualified intermediary status in order to reduce US tax. So that means as long as our members complete a US tax form, which looks like that, they will receive 100% of their US revenue and they don't have to pay any US withholding tax. Now that form may look rather scary and it is rather scary, but happily, a lot of that information can be pre-populated by PPL and we can actually also send it out electronically using DocuSign um, so that you can actually complete it online. And we do send out plenty of reminders to make sure that you complete it within the, the deadline to get the um, US tax benefit. So some important dates for you. I'm going to assume that You've just joined PPL or you're about to join um, as a performer member. If you were also a rights holder member, then the end of January would be the deadline for your repertoire to be registered. Now, let's assume it's 2018. So if you registered your repertoire by the end of January 2018, you'd be eligible for payment within that year. We pay out quarterly typically at PPL. So in March and September, we pay out international money. In June, that's our main UK distribution and adjustment. So for airplay received in 2017, we would pay out 
at the end of June 2018, once all the calculations have been made and all the music reporting data collected and all the repertoire matched against it. The adjustment, that's for the six years that we keep open. So we keep open airplay years back until 2011. Now that means that we can take account of performer lineup changes in particular. So if we become aware of um, an addition to the performer lineup, then our adjustment takes account of that and ensures that the right payments are made to the people on the recording. So if you take the Ravel as an example, the one that I was showing you earlier, if somebody came along late and claimed as a viola player on that, we could then incorporate them into the, the payment. So if you're hoping to become a PPR member and you've had airplay in years previous to this, don't fret because you should still be able to, to get it, providing it's PPR repertoire, of course. You'll see in April and October that we have performer claims deadlines, which are key to, to the distributions that we make in June. And then in December, the December distribution is for extra UK revenue that we get. <clears throat> and it's also for adjustment purposes again, um, as I was saying. And that also applies on the rights holder side if a recording changes ownership. For May, we've got MTV claims. That's if you uh, own any videos. And in November, we have our annual performer meeting, which we do so next week, actually. If you are a PPL member, a performer member, you will get an invite to the APM. And this is a, a very valuable forum where performers are able to, to voice how, how they feel about PPL and how they feel we are performing, but also for PPL to present to performers the performance that we are, that we are doing for them. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you for, for watching this. I hope it's been useful for you. Um, but also to stress that if you've got any questions at any time, um, please get in touch with us at PPL. You can do that through the email address that you see there, or you can call in directly to our uh, member services switchboard, our dedicated switchboard. Please feel free to, to make use of that because um, we're obviously very keen to help you where at all possible. So now is your chance to ask any questions that you may have. Um, please do feel free to type anything in. We're keeping an eye on it. There's one particular question about backing vocals. Can I get money for providing backing vocals? And the answer to that is, Yes, you certainly can, um, as long as obviously you, you have the proof of that contribution, you can certainly claim for that. You would do that in the same way that I claimed as a orchestral cellist, you could claim as a non-featured backing vocalist. And it's also been mentioned um, that PPL can pay uh, unexpected but welcome amounts of money, which is obviously what we like to hear. And happily, we have made those payments in the past. Um, it, it is important to point out that because of the nature, especially of our international collections, um, PPL payments can be quite erratic. So you might get a nice surprise one year for a, a recording of yours that has performed well um, overseas, say in Slovenia, for instance, but it doesn't necessarily follow that you'll receive the same payment a year after. The same going if you have a record that performs particularly well, recording that performs well in 2016, but doesn't do so well in 2017, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get the same payment from us then. I think it's always best to not to assume that um, your payments will be the same. But we would obviously advise you to keep a close eye on your repertoire, as I sh showed you could do by, by logging into PPL, just to check that everything's up to date so that you know that we can then use that data to work on your behalf and hopefully bring in as much as money 
as much money as possible. So any more questions? Uh, we've got a question here. Do you provide data on where the music is being played? Yes, we do. Um, as much as possible, we give you information on where it has been played, particularly with broadcasts. With public performance, we don't always get exact information on where your music has been played, but we know the sector that it's been played in. So sometimes we have to roll up because we have so many licensees. If your music was played um, in a restaurant, for instance, we wouldn't always ask for the restaurant to give us exact records of what they play because that wouldn't be cost effective for us to deal with that. So we would give them the restaurant's money would go into what we call a profile. So sometimes what you might get on your statement is information about the public performance group that your music falls into, say restaurants, hotels, cafes, something like that. So when your distribution is made to you, that will be accompanied for the UK by an itemised statement which shows you, gives you the different categories where your payments fall into. And that statement is always available to you as a PPL member. When you log into my PPL, you can look at your invoice or statement rather and you can have a look at that and it goes into detail. If you're still requiring further detail, it's always worth asking if we can find out more information for you, but the likelihood is that the invoice will, uh, the um, statement, sorry, will contain all the information that you need. Any further questions? So I would stress again, please do get in touch with us on either of those uh, methods because we're, we're a friendly and informative team at Member Services. We want to help you as much as possible. We want to maximise your revenue and get you what you deserve for, for making recordings. So please do get in touch. Um, and to say that this webinar is available on the ISM website, you'll see... Uh, if you go to ism.org slash webinars, you'll be able to view it again from there. And again, if any questions come up when you're looking at it again, please get in touch. Member services at pplukcom or on the phone number that we've given there. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope that's been useful. And please do get in touch anytime. Thank you.